Circle of Birth podcast, reclaiming our birth potential with ancient wisdom and stories from birth and beyond, sharing the rich spectrum of family diversity and transformation, stories worldwide bringing together community and connectivity. Come together with story medicine and inspire at our unique birth journeys. We breathe, we birth, we become to podcast episode 41 and I am so honoured again <laughs> to spend this hour with wise woman, Elder Sunny Carl. Sunny is many, probably known, especially birth workers, as the author of Sacred Birthing. She's a midwife and she resides now in California. Um, she has just moved from Hawaii and her book came to me quite some time ago and I feel sometimes there is a shift in our lives that elevates us to a new thought, new being. And Sunny's book was it for me. It was gifted in the most beautiful circumstances, just when I was ripe and ready to bring my birth work into its light. Oh, and how I've evolved over these years. So I actually really wanted to bring Sunny to the show for a long time and I put the intent out there and here it is. Here she is. I'm so excited to bring this to you guys. So yes, you know, you alone can make a difference. And this episode, I guarantee it'll sit with you. So Sunny joins the show from California and she's basking in her recent and renewed Sacred Birthing second edition. And we also talk about her new exciting book coming soon. Enjoy. Hi, Sunny. Welcome so much to the Circle of Birth podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have your presence with us all the way from California that you've just recently moved, I believe, from Hawaii. Uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So thank you. We're going to talk about a lot of things today, but mainly I would love to speak about how the book came into my life and how you came into my life. I was laying on a bed with an acupuncturist and we were talking about birth and transformation and I was talking about how I wanted to bring something new into what I was doing and I had this big urge to change my path and this was before I even started the podcasting and I had the idea that I wanted to share stories about transformation and um, it was really really good and she talked about this book that she had in her shelf and she said I've had this book and I've never been able to get rid of it and I don't need it anymore um you know she was all grown up and had grandkids and been through it all and she said I don't need this book anymore and she said it was just waiting for the right person and she gave it to me and she you you've written in it her name was Diane <laughs> oh it was Diane um O'Connell from Australia. Oh, <laughs> oh, send her my blessings. I will. No. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah, she was so wrapped that she could finally hand it to someone that was oh, okay. and I just never never even thought that I'd be sitting here talking to you today. So I'm completely honored. So welcome. <laughs> this is how these journeys happen and I'm just absolutely yes. honored to be able to have your presence here now and talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. very yeah. good yeah so um that's that's my story uh, I'd love to hear your story and I know in the book you have these beautiful birth journeys that you share and how you shaped you as a, a woman and a mother and becoming a mother um so how about we start with your birth stories my own birth my baby's birth your babies uh-huh wow yeah. can you well, well, the second edition of, of Sacred Birthing looks the same on the front, but not on the back. Ah. <laughs> and the first whole chapter is now really what shaped me and how, how everything shaped me. Um, and it's much more precise. And I lead you through the, the, um, the mountains and the molehills of... <laughs> mm of how I got there. Um, my kids were incredible because I did everything I knew to do back in 73 with my son, which wasn't, you know, I was, I was just like any mom, 
you know, you do your best, you pay attention to your doctor, you pee in the cup, you ask your, you know, one or two questions if you have time. Um, and you eat well and go to yoga class, you know, <laughs> in 73. Where was your heading of birth when you were pregnant with your first child? Did you have, you know, what was your birth like or what was your sort of interpretation of pregnancy and birth? Did you see breastfeeding? Oh, yeah. Um, wow. Well, back then I had no clue that the birth trauma that I went through was even there. I just knew that my life didn't make sense and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't grapple with it. I couldn't make sense of it. And, um, so I didn't have that piece of information in order to do better for my first baby. And that's why I, in the book, I talk about our firstborn as a sacrificial lamb because we don't know what we don't know until we, we, you know, it's in our face. And so with him, I went, I had a nice old doctor. I went to this doctor every, you know, I did just what they said. Yep. And yet he was, he was born in the hospital with so much interference, you know, and even though it didn't hurt him, um, as far as visible hurt, I just couldn't make sense of the forceps that they used on him when I didn't have need for forceps. My labor was only six hours long, you know, and, and so there was, there was that piece that kept me from working with that birth. Um, and then, so by the next time and being invited to friends births and things like that, by the next birth of my own, uh, I knew I wasn't going to go that route again. And so, um, I had her, I went to, uh, prenatals at a free clinic. This was all of 1976, but, um, but I knew she would be born at home and I didn't even, you know, know really what that meant, except that I knew I wouldn't hurt her, you know? And so. Was that a that, radical thing then to be birthing at home? Um, not as much birthing at home, but birthing without anybody's help there or and nobody there because my husband was asleep. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so in your book, something that really mm -hmm. captured me, and I just don't know if this was when you were pregnant with your first or your second, um, mm -hmm. you talk about the dream that you have with the king and the queen. Oh, yeah. Um, and when they handed the baby to you and they said, this is what a well-born baby looks like, where were you at in your life when you had that dream? Uh -huh. That was long after my babies. That was in 1997 and I was in Mount Shasta, California, just starting to write sacred birthing. That was the very beginning. You know, I had 18 yellow legal pads that I had, had written everything that I could, you know, think of down for the for the book and that was it, it ended up taking seven years but that was the beginning and so I was sitting in that tree just just uh receiving that um and that was the beginning of really the the energetic part you know uh, because of past life therapy and birth therapy I knew how to be gentle and and not scare the baby but I, that was that was the extent of what I knew. And when this dream that wasn't a dream uh, came through, it was saying how to receive the baby and feel the energy of the baby was the energy the same as the soul energy. And that opened up my next steps. Mm. And that's, that's really what sacred birthing is all about. Yeah. So that's where it rolls into, from my understanding of reading Sacred Birthing and being a part of it, is the support that the baby receives when it's placed into the hands of the mother or whoever. Um, there's a part there you talk about that support, you know, that unconditional support that this is their journey and when they come they've got that, that support. And the energetics uh, of that well, with that support, right, if that right. makes sense. Yeah. However, second edition, I've delineated it more clearly. Now I call them uh, soul needs of the baby. 
and these soul needs are the spiritual things that create the highest vibration with the baby so that it protects the baby's consciousness. So that was the whole that was the whole second part of the journey from from 97 on that has been you know, it's harder because it's harder to talk to people about consciousness. We have very few words and vo- vocabulary words about consciousness, altered states, in- enlightenment. What else is there? I mean, there are not many words. words yeah. so, um, so it's hard to talk about it. It's hard to feel it. You know, if your heart is open, you can feel it. But if it's not, can you feel it? Mm. You know, say, oh, you're making it up, or I don't feel anything, or whatever, and then they get um, distraught, or, or kind of just, they won't, they think they're missing something, or they think they're silly, or stupid, or, you know, not intuitive, or whatever, and so, um, luckily, the, the people that come to sacred birthing have an amazing intuition and usually can see more than I do and all sorts of good things. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, I mean, the first edition was pr- published in 2003. This one coming out just in May, um, it, people have so grown and the, the consciousness has risen so much that they're, you know, now what I say is not nothing new. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. Well, in 2003, not so many people got that, mm. you know. Yeah. So it's, interesting. It's, it's interesting with the when you talk about the words and the language and trying to find words for, for these certain things, and especially around consciousness. And I often mm-hmm. wonder with birth that sometimes – when someone has a birth experience, they need to find a word for it to explain what that feeling was like. Um, mm. And then once we put a word to it, we shift that in our body, the energetics of it, what it was and the meaning. Um, right. It just seems to be what we do as a culture sometimes is like find these words and then once it's out there with a word, uh-huh. I feel like it's shifted what could really be within well, to the... You're putting it beautifully because... That's that's just like birth trauma or any birth, any birth that happens. If you tell the baby the birth, the uh, just what happened, then the baby, the feeling that's in the baby matches with the words that you use. And then then it just kind of integrates. And then the baby's ready for the next um, thing that life brings. You know, so it's it's a it's what we all do, actually, not just babies, but but to match the felt sense in the body with the with the words is what it takes to integrate and move on and then be curious about the next moment and that's the whole reason why why we don't want to make the baby fearful or in pain at birth because when they're when they're in pain or fearful they're in this place of defensiveness mm. you know that's mm. like that and what you want them to be in is this place of of beautiful openness and trust, you know, that every baby is in if they're not hurt. Yeah, I just the way you moved your body then, I can almost picture the little babe when they come out and that little stretch, that yes. completely yeah. opening up that chest. And you know what it's like sometimes when you go out in the sun and you... Open your heart to it. Yeah, and that's what we tend to, I feel, probably is more women and we keep forgetting that we, we tend to lock up so much in this area. Um, yeah, we tend yeah. to forget to like, and it feels so nice. Like even just doing it now, it feels amazing having that stretch. I think that's why the little kids fly so much because they have their arms up and they just fly. Oh yeah, and that's just the best it's feeling. The best. It does. Yeah. <laughs> I could just picture therapy sessions for adults and flying, <laughs> having a little kid <laughs> leading the way, and you just follow them. <laughs> Good. So if we could backtrack a bit to your second pregnancy, I'd like uh-huh. to just understand what shifted you to want to birth at home and, um, you know, not having, I guess, like we've talked about the information and the resources available like we do now. It's almost instantaneous. We can tap into something. Um, how was that shift for you? And can you walk us through the birth and how that was? And that was with Alec. Is that right? Alex, your second born. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, she's, um, when I was pregnant with her, it, it, really it was a reaction to the first birth that created a decision that I will do this at home alone because there were no midwives. I looked all over the place. They were five hours away, way too far away. You know, and there was uh, uh, everything I tried didn't happen, you know, couldn't happen in those days. So um, it was about knowing that I did not want this baby born with forceps and I didn't want my membranes stripped and I didn't want, you know, everything that I had seen that hospital births did automatically, whether, whether it was needed or not. It was just the protocol of those days. It still is, you know, in many cases, unless you find a gem of a doc. <laughs> so, um, so that was where I was coming from. And, um, and so, you know, many nights I went into early labor many times and, um, Eventually, it was the right time, and she only ended up coming two weeks early instead of two months early, as it had started out being. And um, and then, you know, I yelled to my husband. He came in, caught her, literally caught her, <laughs> and um, and handed her to me. You know, I put my leg over the umbilical cord because I was backwards. <laughs> I'd been on the toilet the whole night. And then we got in the tub to keep warm because I was so in my uterus, I had never thought to turn on the heat. So that's, that's how it happened. And, and the gift of that birth was that I felt these presences around me that I, at that point I termed angels, you know, and it felt um, totally safe and totally fine. And that's that's all I can say. That was the that was the gift of that birth because, um, you know, I certainly didn't have it with the with Bryce as much as I had wanted it. That there was too much hospital happenings and all of that kind of thing going on. Distraction, <laughs> distraction, right? In, inter, interference, intervention, but also just interruption. Mm, and that's that feeling um, I know in the book where I was reading that you spent some, quite a lot of time on the toilet. Was it dark in there and did you have that safety feeling as well in the toilet? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was dark. It was nighttime. It was January 2nd. Um, and so it was it was freezing <laughs> and it was, it was frozen rain coming on the on the window. So it was just this, you know, very monotonous lovely sounds and everybody was asleep so it was perfect <laughs> wow I love the last minute um just your husband snoozing and then just coming in at the last minute and <laughs> snoozing he was he was downright conked out <laughs> wow he, he was in labor <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. And so you're a grandma now too. Yeah. So you've gone into motherhood. How long after when you first became grandma? And can you describe the feeling? Because did your book get published before then or was that? Mm, yes. No, no. Uh, barely. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My first, <laughs> my first, um, Grandbaby was born in the hospital, but my daughter went went through so much growth doing it that way. She just had to do it. Mm. She just said, no, Mom, I don't want you. That's the way it is. <laughs> and uh, went, you know, got rid of one doctor, got rid of another, got a midwife, changed hospitals to another midwifery place. She just went through her, her steps with it. And, um, and I was there two hours after he was born because the planes didn't run. <laughs> but with the, the next two, I caught them. And, uh, she delivered them, excuse me. All I did was put them, catch them, put, put them up, <laughs> right, up on her. Yeah, she, they were born in, in her apartments, in her bathtub that she, the, the walls she painted dark red. <laughs> wow. 
So it was neat. I was wondering what it would be like, you know, to catch my own grandchildren after after um, so many other babies. And I was really amazed that it didn't feel any different. And at first I kind of went, wow, I'm, I must not, my heart must not be open. You know, how come everybody else says this is the most amazing thing? <laughs> and I just feel like every baby is that amazing, you know? And, and so I had to work that one through because <laughs> I really wondered what was going on with me. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I had an interview with a woman called Jenny Blythe in Australia. We had an interview and we were talking about the similar thing, what it was like. So she was present with her daughter for her birth and she said during that moment she was just being midwife or, mid, you know, midwifing and spiritual midwifing and all that. And she said it wasn't until after a few days later when she drove up the driveway and she saw her daughter holding the baby that's when it really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so I could imagine too like it would probably it's not you know I don't think motherhood hit me straight away or that feeling of transition I think it took a bit of time for me to actually go okay wow like I've just had that made into motherhood uh, yeah. Just, yeah. Just, yeah 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 I just I suppose it's different for each journey isn't it to to really grasp that feeling like now I'm grandma <laughs> yeah. yeah sure yeah and it would be better too if we had all the generations living together this is this is so difficult when you know I'm here and they're there and you know I have a son in Brazil and a daughter in oh, yeah. Colorado yeah. and it's it's not like having them next door and just bopping over to help out or you know yeah. have them together <laughs> Yeah. What shifted you from um, the island to California? Uh, guidance, as usual. Yeah. 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 Just, you know, go here. Yeah. So I did, and I'm still in process of finding out why. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, hope, I hope that comes to you. <laughs> I know it will. Yeah. It's always a huge, beautiful move, yeah. you know, and I'm always very grateful for it. Yeah. And it's something that I could never have foreseen. So I just follow it. Mm. It's a willing, yeah. ready to have a piece of land and have grow roots. <laughs> yeah, we, we've just moved recently and I'm wanting that same thing. It's like I literally want to put roots down as in yeah. food. I know. And I'm like I feel and like me. Yeah. Have, your, have your support system and, and let that grow deep. Yeah, yeah. it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, like a, coming from me, I tend to be this person that just I, I probably haven't settled anywhere properly for a long time. Like my son's seven now and he's probably had about eight houses <laughs> since he's seven because we were just – opportunity would open. We'd go from here to here right. to here to here to here. Of um, course. But it feels different this time, which is really – Oh, good. good. I feel like I'm yeah. – oh. <laughs> Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which is nice. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So, what really resonated with me with this book? Mm-hmm. And I know it's probably such, and this is the way these things work. So, this insignificant little line out of a whole book can just shape you. And the yes. thing was for me was universal agreements that you spoke about. Um, natural law agreements, so birth, death and honouring and allowing the flow of that, um, which has opened me into not just birth work but death as well. And I know with my second born, not long after, I had this moment where I just looked up and I remember saying, like, this is how we should be allowed to die. Like, I felt so that that safe, nurtured, um, all of that was in its space and I really f- tricked connected that with the death path and felt for all the people dying <laughs> at the same time and going this is the path that they should have space to have this as well and um, mm-hmm. I've before my second born I went through a miscarriage and the lessons that came from that were just and the gifts the gifts of that too were just absolutely really altering and I had 
this in my head. You know, I had this universal agreements in my head and this natural law and it really helped the process a lot. Natural law to me, uh, well, with the first book, I gave so much credence to spirit. Yeah. And this, by the time the second book was was written, I realized that it's all nature. Spirit has very little to do with birth and conception and and death. <laughs> mm. And it's all nature. So there, natural law was such a, a deep uh, instilled knowing um, that this is what it takes to birth and death and conceive. You know, nature is is who we are, and we have a long, long, long time of patriarchy where it tells us that, you know, the body is not uh, the most important and that spirit is and that after after life is, you know, when in reality, hey, this present body and this present time is is pretty darn amazing. It's the gate swinging one way or swinging the other. Mm. Yeah. One is death and one is death. Yeah. And and it's just you know those of, those of us who stand at it it's the same passage. You know, it feels the same. It looks the same. It's it it is the same. Mm. It's just one way coming and going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I yeah. could just you almost must have felt that you're dead. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's sort of people that have had these near-death experiences that are just so willing to share so much about life that I love yeah. gravitating to. And after yeah. these experiences, a, a new knowledge comes to them. And um, yeah. I just find it so interesting because they always say that it's not scary. It's actually safe. And they, you know, but they just knew it wasn't their time. But they got a mm -hmm. feel of what that path mm -hmm. was and it actually mm -hmm. excites me you know to um, mm -hmm. to know that that's a potential and a possibility because they're yeah. so close birth and death death and doula because it doesn't frighten you because you can stand there and say no this is okay this is just right this is what's happening you know can i give you a drink of water <laughs> but but you're holding the, the bigger picture, you're holding the important part, the energy of this is just right and go in your own timing. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, good for you. So how about then, because oh, I know you were a midwife uh -huh. and past life therapist and a Steiner teacher, a Waldorf teacher. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm wondering too, as part of, I know you sort of stepped down and, with the midwifery um, no I haven't you haven't <laughs> right okay yeah tell us about that then being a midwife right how how do you navigate the system in your consciousness oh. and knowing what you know and how do you best serve people well you way? know I don't mix with the system usually um well, that was the magic of what I found in birth, that if you birth at the highest vibration, all the energy is combed. There are not knots in it. There's not upsets in it. There's not, uh-oh, let's go to the hospital in it. You know, the highest vibration is is the safest place to birth. And so I didn't have to mix with the system. Um when and you were training as a student, did oh you, yeah, what, what was yes. the training like? Was that through a like a college or a? Uh, it was through Maternidad La Luz in okay. in Paso, Texas. And so yes, we uh, if they were badly torn, we would go to a to a doctor and have them sewn up. Or if if they really did need a C section, we would take them in. So that way, we did interface. For sure. And when you were, when you, what brought you into midwifery? What made you decide to say, okay, I'm, I oh. want to become a midwife. Well, I, need to I do was that. 10. My mom, I was going to deliver babies when I grew up. I just had a knowing. I must have come in having been a midwife a million other times, just knowing this is what I'm going to do. 
you know, and that's why I chose to be born in a family of six so I could watch it over and over again. Mom gets big and fat. She comes home with a baby. (laughs) (laughs) So you knew you wanted to be a midwife, but the path wasn't ready for you yet. Right. Because, I had to do all sorts of other things, which which t- turned out to be tools in my toolkit. But at the time, it was so frustrating because all I wanted to do was be a, a midwife. And first, I had to be a past life therapist. Why do I have to do this when I wanted to be a midwife? <laughs> and then I had to be, uh, you know, first was a Waldorf teacher, you know, and and then that led me back into that amazing um, understanding of, of where the wounding is in children. And, and so everything led me back into birth and it's all in a whole chapter now (laughs) so that it's all, all understood as, you know, as, as the journey, because the journey, mm, making sense of my birth makes sense of why I've, I've stuck to, um, everything that sacred birthing is about. You know, my, my, as I say, I, I have not given up midwifery because, because that vision is still on my plate. The vision that said, um, master souls will be coming, you know, and, and, and so I'm, I'm here hanging out going, okay, show me, show me each next step. So version two of sacred birthing, that was, so you'd been a midwife for quite a while and a lot of things changed for you, hence version two of sacred birthing. Uh Yeah. The second edition. edition. Um, Yeah, I grew up. (laughs) Yeah. But growing up also meant going through the dark night of the soul for 18 years and coming out the other end and um, understanding what made me me and acknowledging it and seeing the power in it and seeing how I could translate this to other people and, and the, the, the parents that are, that are going to be coming to, to give birth to these magnificent souls. <laughs> what do you feel in that 18 years, was it? Uh-huh. Yeah, 18 huh. years, yeah. What, what's some of the, main things that you felt shifted for you well the whole the whole thing was coming uh into discovering that nature was the core the core of us it sounds so trite but it's real it's very real the core the mother the cosmic mother the great mother the gaia you know in all dimensions of her are are who we are and that was huge um, understanding more about vibration and, and bringing these children in from a huge high vibration. My new book is called Conceiving Souls of Magnificence. Mm-hmm. And I love it. It will be out <laughs> in early September. Wow. So, yeah, that's, that's who I feel these beings are. They're, you know, the master souls coming. I'm just writing that and, down. <laughs> And and the other part of the vision was that um, there was a place to receive them. There was a sanctuary where they could come in without uh, without the energy closing up each each time in between births. If you go to a, a home birth, you create the energy bubble field, you know, the stargate, whatever the words are. You create it each time, and then after the three days are up after birth, the energy closes down. Well... With a sanctuary, the energy doesn't have to close down. It can just remain open and get stronger with each birth. Mm. And then yeah. is that so I'm just Yes, so yeah. that's so that <laughs> babies can be born. <laughs> yeah, that's page eighty two and eighty three of the first edition. Isn't that beautiful. Right. I've seen it in um some or pictures. The, yeah, oh, you've got it on the back. Yes. On the back, the, okay, yeah. but on the back of the new book. You've seen everybody? that picture? You've yeah, seen well, that I've pic- seen it um, in a few photos with shamanic practices that people have oh, taken yes. on the outside. Right, yeah. where that, that theme goes yep. 
and travels, yeah. Yeah, and they had – it was really interesting, the different flares of light in these pictures. And they, when a shaman looked at them, he described the meaning of them. And I can't – I don't want to word it because I'll probably get it wrong. Mm. But it was something similar to – that was the orange is like the light of protection or something like that that's mm. they're calling in and then mm-hmm. there's all these other little squiggly ones on the outside that's why that uh-huh. he was saying this is why we do this chanting and etc cetera, etc cetera, because we're trying to keep that bubble of wow. protection <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> I, th- I think Very that's good. yeah yeah Very good yeah so yeah. when i saw these i was like oh wow like that's you know and oh how nice I, that, I guess that's the joy of photography, if you can capture something like yeah. that. It's just beautiful. Every, every This was when they um, – there was the same camera and it was just normal film. It was back when – in the times of film. And every of the 20, 27 photos had had these things in them. These were just four of the ones I picked. Wow. <laughs> I know. It was amazing. And but he's it was an amazing birth and he's an amazing child. Yeah. And what – where where were you at when you, this birth happened? In Maui. Okay. Yeah. 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 And that's a very energetic place. Yeah. And we is. were yeah. outside in a hot tub and uh, oh. we had been in that hot tub for many other births, you know, but yep. yeah, this one just, everything came together. You're listening to the Circle of Birth podcast. Circleofbirth.com. Who's the Hawaiian goddess? The I think it's fire. Pele. Is it Pele? Pele. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is she the one that lured in the people on the boats? Ooh, I haven't heard one? of that. No. Luring people on the boat. Well, I, I met her on the edge of the of the um, volcano. I was sitting on the edge. And it goes way down deep, but I was sitting right there, and she said something, and I don't remember what it was. And I wish but I did, but I just burst into tears, and I I just went, okay, I'll be here, wow. you know, and that's how I got there. Yeah. How long did you spend there? Fifteen years. Did you? Yeah. Well, Sixteen, counting the last. Yeah. yeah. Could you describe a typical birth in Hawaii? What would someone do? Uh, Oftentimes they were outside, which was just delicious. Mm. And you, you could just feel so much the, the, the trees be alive presences, you know, and the ancestors filling in the, the spaces and the birds would be there. And it, it was just, it was, it's just so remarkable to be outside giving birth. Um, you have to, you have to think ahead of time, you know, because you need shade and you need you know, you need to really set it up and, and do it right. But if you can do it, it's amazing. Wow. And, and some of these were at a sanctuary and they were, they were with many people around. Um, and oftentimes I, I get, well, you shouldn't have people around at a birth. You need to have it quiet and, you know, so that the mom doesn't feel observed and all of Dr. Leboyer's, uh, not Leboyer, oh, don't. Um, and what he says, but it's different when people are so used to a community and they trust everybody, the whole thing's about trust. And as soon as you have a field of trust, then they don't care if there are a hundred people there, you know, and the, the hundred people act as an amoeba as just like one person, one person feels the mom's cold and she brings a sweater. Another person knows she needs a drink. You know, it's just like we're all acting as one and that's the magic of it. Wow. So men and women or is it women's business only? No, it depends on what dad want. And dad usually wants a man there or men are three. You know, I mean, it, there's no number. Dad is always seems to be very happy with having a, a male strong figure, a role model to be there with him. Wow. And the mom, and so they, they think of it themselves, you know, and decide what's to be. Because, yeah, well, that makes sense because of how you describe it's baby's journey too. So are they really mm-hmm. tapping into what baby needs? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because if you don't, then baby will, will choose who's there no matter what. You know, and baby, I've seen parties 
uh, that people were going to have. And baby said, nope, I'm coming now and nobody's going to be there. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and you midwifed over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how, how did that shape you as a person? Did you learn a lot of traditional practices like with – do they still talk about and utilise the goddesses and the ancient ones? It's – it's growing more and more that that there's so much more um, emphasis and love of the whole culture now than there was even 15 years ago. Um, so rarely did I ever find anybody I could ask questions to. Um, I remember one lady and she said the goddess Hina is around you. So make use of it and talk to her and communicate with her so that you, you know, are, are sure to, to make use of her goodness. So, um, but as far as specifics, no, except that I always had the feeling that the ancestors were there, the land, the land is so alive with the ancient ones and the you know, from the little ones that they call Menahuni to the to the great big brown beings that show up in the woods. You know, when we're out in in this beautiful place that we had the the bounty to to birth in a couple times, um, it was just a lovely place right next to a waterfall, and it was magic. and And it had a long meadow. And I remember looking up and seeing all these great big brown faces line the whole meadow. It was amazing. And then, um, and at that birth, uh, the mom couldn't decide who to invite because there's such a protocol of, um, and a hierarchy of if you invite this one, you have to invite this one, and if blah, blah, blah. And she just threw up her hands and said, I'll invite them all. <laughs> <laughs> they were very respectful and were all behind her and yet it was just such a field of deliciousness that was support and strength and yes you can do it go for it you know it was so beautiful it was just it was just one of those births that you just never 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 forget and you want each birth each mom and dad to have that um the the, the beneficial qualities that came in that one wow it's like goosebumpy just listening to that I can just visualize I'm a very visual person as well and huh? once you start talking I I set the scene in my head and all you know it was just oh, gorgeous it, and all I got from that was the essence of support and mm-hmm. out of all of these podcasts that I've already done to me it all just comes to support and it, for birth for birth and, yeah yeah uh, one hundred percent for that mother and that babe or babes, yeah. however many yeah. need to come out, is it's, yeah. and it's just like you say that's that is the ancient story, the ancient lineage that we need to pass through. To yes. Each other. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once that is seen and experienced, but once it's felt, if you're a doula at, at one of these births, or if you are a mom or a a, a, a visitor. You know, an invited guest, anybody, not a visitor, an invited guest. But if you feel what's happening and you're standing at this birth and you feel it, you never forget it. And then you can come back and, and do that for the next person. It's why, why I think um, all, all of us, all moms, all women have been midwives in the past we're just, it's just a normal part of existence a long time ago. We've just lost it now so that we think that only a few people are midwives. That's baloney. You know, we've all been midwives. We've all held the space for birth and for death, you know, and that's why it seems so amazingly raw, but real and powerful. I was talking to someone the other day about and this is where we go back to, like we were saying before, about labelling and once you say a word, then it means this. And then we grow up in a society and think midwives are someone that will work in a hospital and deliver babies. And right. that's it, limitation. But right. this is what I was having this conversation with the other day about that limitation. But it's – this is and just what you said, it's – traditionally a midwife was – 
so much more than that. And call the midwife was to call for so many more things than just catching a baby. Um, right. Birth, death. It was everything. healing. It healing. was healing. Yeah. Yeah. Herb, yeah. Herb law, wise women tradition. Um, yeah. 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 So I think it's all about softly and gently reclaiming midwifery mm -hmm. and healing that sort of wounded lineage of midwifery and bringing it back into its essence again um, in that nice, soft, feminine way, I guess. Yeah. Because, again, mm -hmm. it comes to support and, um, you know, doulas are just so popular now. Like 20 years ago, no one would have known what a doula is. Um, right. Right. Yeah, seven years ago, when I birthed my first son, I didn't know what a doula was. I found out what a doula was. Now I wish I had one. So I think doulas are, are the way of the future. Yeah. I love doulas. I think they can do so much more than midwives can because so many of our hands are tied now, you know, that that the doulas don't have to have tied hands. They can they can do what they need to do yes that's right they're fantastic and they're that's the the i mean this is it that's their spiritual midwives and it's just if yeah. you call the midwives then you get legal obligations right. associated <laughs> the hassles, right but they they don't have the hassles yeah that's yeah and that's yeah. and that's good for the for the moment and i know that they're trying to i, I think there's certain states in the u.s isn't it that you can't call yourself a doula or um oh really yeah. Oh, I heard that in the in the uh, in the U.S. Yeah. Um, I don't know which state, so I'm not going to say. But I know that I've been reading about a certain doula that wasn't, you know, attending a birth, or and she's had criminal charges and blah 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 blah. And I know that's the same with midwifery, isn't it? That you have CPMs, certified practicing midwives, and then hospital. Yeah. 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 Sometimes at home. Sometimes at home. Yeah. They're breaking out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, Australia is not much different. There's a lot of over-regulation of midwives. And if you're a home birth midwife in Australia, because of the regulation now, if you wanted to birth at home, you're looking at paying about seven and a half to $9,000. Oh, I thought it was illegal. It's not illegal anymore? It's legal, but it's so... Expensive. It's so yeah. expensive. It's so strict um, yeah. that, you know, people are just – it's going to shift underground. Um, right. Before it again. Comes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, again, that's where doulas are fantastic because if they keep within that support role, uh, this is what we need. And I don't think anyone should have that feeling of having to shift underground because out of fear or out of cost or running from something. Um, exactly. Which brings and, you know and the worst yeah. reason to have an unex un unattended birth is is the cost. You know you have to you have to feel inside yourself every day, every moment. Is this still the best for, idea for me? You know it's it's not just an automatic because it's because I don't have the money or because I don't have a midwife. You know I'll do this. It, it, you have to. You have to really pay attention to the inner and make sure that you're addressing every single bit of inner work in order for labor to go well and, and birth to happen easily. Mm, that's such good advice to all those mamas out there um, that are in that, you know, in that time. It's just so important to find that go within and listen to baby's journey. What's, what's baby telling us? <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah. Everyone listen to that advice from Sunny, please. <laughs> and it's hard because we are surrounded by information that comes to us instantaneously. Yeah. There's yeah. so much uh, distraction and noise and... And so much fear. And fear. So much fear. It's mm. just so sad, you know, yeah. and, and everybody's journey is different. So yeah. there's no risk to take on the fear, but you can use it as your barometer. You know, oh, I got a... Two fearful things today? Oh, where is it in me? Where is it in me that I, you know, can do this inner work right now? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and what yeah, what does it teach you? There's what are the lessons and what yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> do you feel drawn to any more work with past life or birth trauma? Is that still mm. coming to you as a I I do that 
I used to do past life therapy with the people that would be at the birth and with the parents. Cheers. <laughs> um, so that they wouldn't drag their own birth happenings into the baby's birth. And that was that was an amazing thing that really just cleaned the the whole Mostly for the last many years, it has been what I would address in the in the um, prenatal appointment because my prenatal appointments were not quickies; <laughs> they were very long, <laughs> and and we would go deeply because every mom needs it. You know, every every mom needs a mentor to to have for birth so that, you know, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's, she's reading, she's doing her, her work, but you know, we need much more. Uh, and this is where I think doulas could take over so much more. Um, but I must say I liked doing it because that creates the relationship between you and the parents. Mm. I would always have the dad there as well, every appointment. Yeah. And, and that way they, you know, the trust was huge between us all. And I knew what to expect when the, with them and they knew who I was and what what they needed to um, do in order to work together best. You know, so it was, uh, long appointments were just a part of it. And, and their birth trauma, yes, of course it plays into it. Um, so we would talk about it. And uh, I don't remember doing too many, not in, not in Kauai anyway. Um, in Maui, I did more of it. And Mount Shasta, I did a lot. And Iowa, I did a lot of, of uh, past life therapy with births. So a lot of, we have a lot of birth workers that listen yeah. to this podcast, um, mm -hmm. a lot of doulas. And... Do you feel it's really important as a doula or a midwife to, with the partner, um, now men are new to being a part of birth. Um, it's not so long ago that they've come into the birth space. More, more so more in so, Australia. Yeah, in you. Australia, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. think it's important to engage with the partner, their birth experience, even their own birth, what they Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what I would like to say to Australia men is that please go with your woman to uh, the prenatals because your questions are exactly the same as a, a mom's questions. And I feel it's, it's our um, negligence our meaning our as midwives it's our negligence because we didn't bring the father in to begin with you know they have to take part in it if they're going to show up for it and how are they going to show up for it if they don't hear hear the answers to the questions that they ask and that the mom asks they're all the same questions they were men in past lives they were women in past lives and we've all lost our power in birth so the questions are all the same and and yes, I had a a, a man, <laughs> a man who was um, from Uruguay, who who uh, whose mom was an OBGYN, and he was born by by C-section, of course, because if you had money, that was what route you took. But um, but when I started talking to him, his whole thing was that. Babies have to be born at the at the uh, hospital because the baby goes goes this way, you know, the head's over here, the butt's over here, and the legs are over here. And when I said no, 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 the babies are this way with the head down and the and the butt up, you know, he goes, oh, that's how they can come out. <laughs> oh, wow, such a simple thing, mm -hmm. but it would absolutely keep him from trusting that birth could happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So. It's really good to say what happened in your birth. Talk to your mom. Have you ever talked to your mom? Talk to her and see what happened. You know, and moms, the grandmom would love to talk about the birth, you know, to their sons and to their daughters. So that's that's always like a, whoa, lots of information comes out. Good advice for 
birth workers especially is yep. yeah talk to him even as as you know I've done it with my mother as part of a lot of journey work and I found by asking her about my birth it opened up so many more pathways into my connection with my mother that I didn't know was there and um, yes it was actually yes. quite a yeah it was a healing experience to, to yes. do that with her so yeah if if you can yeah. and yeah especially for partners yeah, you, you pick up things that you had no clue of, but you've lived out in your life. So you can really see birth trauma and how it relates just by somebody's thought back then and how it's played out in your life. It's very fascinating. So a lot of men have been really happy to have talked to their mom. Yeah. Um, you would be close to a woman called Elena Tonetti. Uh-huh, um, yep. Yeah, right now. Um, yeah. I did an interview with her and I was – very honoured to have her and she describes that similar thing as to our birth imprint uh, uh, coding. Um, we went right through that that sort of spectrum of what that means and how much mm -hmm. our imprint can shape our lives. And just like you said, that energetic, when that baby's born, can once you start applying the layers of words and all the rest onto the baby, then that's how the imprint will happen. And again, this is why doulas are amazing because they've you know, a lot of doulas are really coming into consciousness and offering mm -hmm. this in someone's pregnancy journey and being mm -hmm. able to sit with them for a few hours and go through all of this huge work. And so what I would suggest again to them is just to be strong enough to say, I will meet with you too when you have a time together, but don't just meet with the mom, yeah. you know, because it leaves dad in the dust and he'll never catch up. And then he feels inept and doesn't know where to begin. Yeah. So exactly. the duel is, please, yeah, talk to dad at the same time as mom. Mm. So yeah. thank you so much for your time. It was fun. <laughs> Sacredbirthing.com is where yep. we can find your new book. Be and sure to look at the second edition. Yes, second edition, everybody. That will have the links to buy the books internationally as well, like, yes. so say, people yes. in Australia. And, and it should be on Amazon in Australia anyway. Yeah. And the new book will be there shortly. Yeah, I'm excited. So um, yeah. what's it called again? Conceiving Souls Con at... Of Magnificence. Yes, I love it already. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be out in September. And if we just keep checking your website, then we'll be able to know. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. I'll send you an email. Thank you, Sonny. You're welcome. Lots of wise words. Anything that you wanted to say to wrap it up that you felt mm -hmm. that you could talk about? Just love that baby. Just love that baby no matter what because love heals birth trauma. Love heals, love heals everything, you know, and the, the baby just uh, gets the love it needs and it can, it can just the way we talked about, the distress is there. And the, you know, the words of love can melt it all and then the baby can move on. And there's, there's a, uh, there's no need to stay in that defensive, you know, position. There's just that place of trust then. Did this episode tickle your heart? move and rattle you in its wisdom i hope you resonated with the show please head over to the website circleofbirth.com for show notes including my personalized take on the episode pictures resources and how you can connect with a storyteller sign up to the newsletter and most importantly please help this show grow to its full potential of serving you in its ancient wisdom donations made easy via paypal all donations will be received with love head to circleofbirth.com slash donate. And yes, I'd love an iTunes rating. This has been another episode of the Birth Share Project. We breathe, we birth, we become. We honour you and embrace.